we have two choices in life. We can have an ordinary life or we can have an extraordinary life. And for my son, I try to teach him that um, we're here to have extraordinary lives. Uh, and unfortunately, too many of us settle for ordinary lives. And there are three principles I think that I try to pass on to him. And the first and the most important is to live by your imagination, um, not by your rational mind. The, uh, your uh, imagination are simply that area of the brain that produces the pictures of who you are and what you're supposed to be doing. I have been following that every day of my life, my creative life, since 1981 when I became an actor in New York. And it has never, ever failed me, and I'll tell you why. Your imagination cannot lie to you. Your rational mind will lie to you. It's there to protect you from hurt. It's there to, for the fight or the flight. But your imagination will not lie to you because it doesn't know how to. All it is is a 24-7 reassessment or assessment of um, constant assessment of who you are and what you're supposed to be doing. What's doing, everybody? I'm Alec Lace. Thank you for watching First Class Fatherhood. Today's guest on the podcast is John O'Hurley. John is well known as being one of the most memorable characters on the smash hit comedy sitcom series Seinfeld as Jay Peterman. He's had many other TV roles. He's been a game show host of shows like Family Feud. You've seen him on Dancing with the Stars. He's an accomplished pianist as well as a Broadway actor who has starred in Chicago. I'm on to have him on the podcast today get down there smack that subscribe button tap the like and let's jump into it right now with john o'hurley on first class fatherhood joining me now first class father john o'hurley welcome to first class fatherhood nice to be here nice to be here indeed all right well let's start right here how many kids do you have how old uh, I have one son. He's uh, 14 years old, uh, soon to be 15. Uh, he's a freshman now in high school. Very cool. What kind of sports activities is he into? Uh, video games, video games, and uh, then he loves video games as well. Uh, <laughs> it is actually it has stripped him of his <laughs> love love for physical competition. But he's a very good golfer and a decent tennis player. So we at least uh, gave him those skills. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, I got four kids. I got I got a couple of gamers in there myself, so I know what that's all about. Uh, if you could, John, please just take one minute here to hit my listeners with a little bit about your background and what you do. Oh, well, uh, I'm an actor. I always have been. I'm a, a composer, a writer. Uh, I do a great deal of speaking. Uh, and uh, uh, my life has been uh, in the entertainment communities from beginning to end. Yeah, obviously, you've had a tremendous career. And take me back to the beginning then of your fatherhood journey here, John. About how old were you when you became a dad and how did becoming a father kind of change your perspective on life? Well, I was a late dad. I uh, was 52 years old when my son was born. Uh, and uh, I had two scenarios in my life. I would either have children or I would not. And I was happy with both. Um, but I did meet a woman uh, that I married back uh, several years before that uh, uh, I couldn't uh, perceive of not having a family with. And so uh, so we had a child together and um, uh, we just decided on one. Um, I didn't want to be the only dad at a PTA meeting with a colostomy bag. So I decided that uh, uh, one was enough. And uh, we were very lucky. God blessed us with a great son. Very, um, he's, uh, he's a perfect child for us and very easy to raise. And uh, uh, he's self-maintaining almost. <laughs> well said. Yeah. Hey, John, what would you consider to be the, some of the top values that you hope to instill in your son growing up? Well, I have three elements that I really uh, focus on in my life. I always refer to it as the, the Peterman Guide to the Extraordinary Life. <laughs> I, uh, I do a great deal of motivational speaking to uh, corporations around the country. And, uh, and I try to instill the notion that we have two choices in life. We can have an ordinary life or we can have an extraordinary life. And for my son, I try to teach him that, um, you know, we're here to have extraordinary lives. Uh, and unfortunately, too many of us settle for ordinary lives. And there are three principles I think that I try to pass on to him. And the first and the most important is to live by your imagination, um, not by your rational mind. The, uh, your uh, imagination are simply that area of the brain that produces the pictures of who you are and what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, you can call it instinct if you like to, but I like to call it imagination because they are pictures, the recurring pictures of who you are and where you're supposed to be. I have been following that every day of my life, my creative life, since 1981 when I became an actor in New York. And it has never, ever failed me, and I'll tell you why. Your imagination cannot lie to you. 
a rational mind will lie to you. It's there to protect you from hurt. It's there to, for the fight or the flight. But your imagination will not lie to you because it doesn't know how to. All it is is a 24-7 reassessment or assessment of um, constant assessment of who you are and what you're supposed to be doing. So imagination is the most important. The second is um, is contemplation, um, stillness, learning how to be still, to be outside of time, because worrying about your future and living in the past are absolutely the causes of all of stress in life. But living in the present moment is kind of where God is, because God is outside of time. And the final one is the notion of appreciation. And that is very simply recognizing the inherent value and the inherent vulnerability in every human being. Yeah, wow. It, really powerful stuff, John. And I, I love your philosophy. And I, I'm, I'm right there with you. I think it was Montaigne who said a strong imagination begets the event itself. And um, I, I've kind of reimagined my life in that way. I'm a recovering alcoholic, a recovering addict. And I'm someone who at one point uh, got a lifetime ban from Giant Stadium. And then fast forward, the NFL invited me to come to Super Bowl Media Day. And there I was interviewing Tom Brady. And many people have always asked me, how did you manage to do all this? And I say, I imagined it first. And I played that out in my imagination. And before I knew it, I was standing in front of Tom Brady. I was invited to the White House. I, I've done all these things. And I've really held to my imagination for a lot of that. And, um, uh, you know, call it faith, call it whatever you like. But um, I, I always defer to people to say, um, um, Mark eleven twenty four is um, whatsoever you ask for in prayer, believe you have received it and it will be yours. And I think mm -hmm. that goes right in line with that entire philosophy. So um, I, I really love to hear what you say there. How, how about as far as discipline goes, John, what type of disciplinarian are you as a dad? And is that different than the discipline style that you grew up with? Well, I grew up with, no, it actually is for, it uh, lines up very much coincidentally with the way my father was with me. Uh, he was a, a very wonderful example of, of, uh, of great morality. Uh, he had a sense of uh, a sense of purpose and a sense of ethics that uh, I lived with and all the way up until uh, he passed away last year at the age of 91. Um, in terms of how I approach my disciplining, um, that's exactly who I am. I'm the discipliner. My wife is the uh, my wife is the cuddler and the, and the cuddler and uh, uh, and the nester. Uh, and it works very well. And I like that because I don't mind being the discipliner. I'm not here. To, I'm not here on this earth to be my son's best friend. And I think people make really, I think people make distinct mistakes when they try to befriend their children and are upset when they don't uh, have great friendships with their children. It's not important. Your job is to is to use the sickle and clear the path in front of that child so that they have a decent, decent opportunity to be a useful and moral human being. Your job is to leave the earth with another gift that God gave to you, which is that child. So my job to discipline him uh, is based on what I believe is a moral code. And I don't I don't shake from it. I don't apologize for it. Um, and I being a father, I find that um, I now have to say no to things that um, that I would have said yes to. Uh, when I was back in my swinging bachelor days. Uh, yeah, and, and much like you, listen, my father was 50 years old when he had me, and I grew up with that kind of, um, that, that threat of uh, just wait till your father comes home. And I often say, hey, if, if I was ever caught out there breaking windows in a store or something, I would rather the police get me than my father ever get me. And I think <laughs> when you don't have that, as we see, you know, I talk about on my show, the fatherless crisis, we have so many kids growing up without a father or a father figure in their life. It's leading to all this uh, chaos that I think we're seeing from the breakdown of our nuclear families. And we're seeing this throughout our society here that it's causing uh, wreaking a lot of havoc all over the country. I agree with you 100 percent. And as I said, um, back when I was a swinging bachelor, there was a lot of things that I uh, could say yes to. But we ultimately define ourselves not by what we say yes to, but what we say no to. And um, so I've had to stand up now as a uh, uh, as as a sense of a person with a moral code and say, no, these are there are things in the world that are wrong, intrinsically wrong. Um, and, and, and not subjectively wrong. They are intrinsically wrong. And I have to stand by those values now.
Yeah, and uh, far too many people don't uh, don't do as you're doing right now, and I think that's part of the issue as well. And I'll, I'll tell you what, just for myself, uh, my daughter is uh, my youngest. I have three boys and then a girl, and I am having a little bit of a difficulty applying the same discipline as I do to my boys to my daughter. My wife's constantly getting on me and hampering me about tightening down a little bit, so I'm still a work in progress um, <laughs> with that. I, I wanted to get it into your career here real quick, John. Obviously, you're known as uh, Jay Peterman. I, I think that uh, the Se- Seinfeld is arguably one of the greatest, uh, if not the greatest sitcom of all time. I know uh, here it is 20 something years later and Netflix just signed a a $500 million deal to get Seinfeld onto their network. Uh, It's still very popular to this day. How are you as far as being set? uh, You've had so many uh, roles over your career, but being sick, how do you feel about being known as Jay Peterman? And what does your son think about? Does he watch the show? Does he have any feedback from it? Well, he watches it a little bit. I wouldn't say that, but I think it's, uh, you know, it's been an interesting evolution of my son growing up in my shadow as much as I've tried to, uh, you know, um, embrace him in my arms. Um, You know, at at one point when he is, uh, he was four years old and I was driving him to school one morning, he said, hey, daddy, just how famous are you? You don't know how to answer a question like that. It's always <laughs> it's just it's a silly question, but it's but it it does underscore the fact that he's had to grow up uh, having a father who is um, you know with a with a, a large body of work that um, that people know. Uh, I, I try not to make much of it because I don't make much of it. I've been lucky enough to you know have. Um, have, have been, lived through the, uh, put my fingers through the belt loops of some pretty good franchises, Seinfeld being one of them. Uh, and uh, I've been very, very fortunate in my career. And I think the the best way that I can show how grateful I am is to be, is to, is to downplay it and keep it in perspective. Um, I've been lucky. I've kind of riven, risen to the challenge when I had to. Um, but I'm uh, it, in, enormously grateful for the opportunities that I have had that a lot of people have not. Yeah, very well said. Yeah, I, I, I've had uh, Jason Alexander on the podcast here. Uh, you know, I'm a big fan of Seinfeld myself, so it's been um, it's been amazing to see uh, the success of that show continues to have. And I, I wanted to bring up, John, I know that you had a, a sister that passed away from uh, epilepsy and you've been involved with the foundation uh, throughout your career. What what is what has changed about what you, we know now about ep- epilepsy? How far have we come? How far do we need to go? And what could parents know right now that maybe just had a kid or maybe are just discovering that they have someone in the family with epilepsy? Well, let's let's begin with the last part of your question, which is really what happens when a child is diagnosed with epilepsy? It changes the dynamic of the of the entire family. Um, that will be probably the last good night of sleep that the parents have ever going are ever going to have, um, because there is a there is a syndrome called sudden unexpected unexpected death in epilepsy, SUDEP. It's referred to as, um, and because of that, um, uh, it's a traumatic thing for for parents. But yet you want to give your child the as as normal a life as you possibly can. Um, so you have to focus, a parent has to focus on how do we manage seizure control. That's the most important thing. If you can control the seizures, then a child can live a, a relatively normal life. Um, in my sister's case back in 1970, that was not the case. There were only two drugs available, Dilantin and uh, phenobarbital. And those both were discovered back in the Civil War times. Uh, and they were used for much different for different purposes, but discovered that they had some seizure ac- applications. But unfortunately, the side effects of taking the medication was about as bad as having the actual syndrome of epilepsy. So over the years, um, there has been some improvement in epilepsy. It is still the great unknown. All of the syndromes, all of the disorders of our, our brains are still the great unknown. It is the most mystical organ in the body. Um, and, and epilepsy is probably the best known of those. Um, when uh, my sister was there, we had two, two drugs. Today, we have 31 drugs that have shown very uh, good promise in controlling seizures. There are now uh, surgical uh, options. There are dietary options, believe it or not. Uh, and even uh, cannabis oil has now come in. There is uh, uh, Greenwich Pharmaceuticals now has a cannabis uh, a product uh, that has shown enormous um, uh, benefits in two different types of almost untreatable uh, seizures. Uh, so there's been enormous um, growth. However, it is still one of the most unfunded um, 
uh, uh, syndromes that there is right now. It's not sexy. And when you see a child have a grand mal seizure, it's not sexy. You know, it, and it's very difficult to to put that into terms. It's one of the most violent things you can watch. Um, and it changes, you know, it changes a lot of the child's social circle as well. So it's a very, very difficult thing to, to deal with. But it's something that we have to keep. And I've been dedicating my life to to getting the word out there that, you know, people with epilepsy are, are normal, everyday people. They just happen to have epilepsy. And the more that we can do, the more that we can fund and research, and the more that we can create these new regimens, uh, therapeutic regimens, um, the better the idea will be that people can manage their epilepsy, if not, in fact, absolutely um, uh, eradicate it. Uh, some because there are people that grow out of it. Um, so that's uh, it, it's been uh, you know a labor of love for me. Uh, it's always in my sister's name um, that I do this. So it was my love for her and um, and uh, and also in recognition of how it changed the dynamic of the family and my empathy for all those that that do have children with epilepsy and how difficult this time is because um, you know all of a sudden a child will have epilepsy but you now have many 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 caregivers and people that are affected by it in the surrounding family. Good stuff, John. Where, where's the best place people could go to either find out more or donate if they want to help and, and help with the funding and the research? Where do you suggest they go to? You go right to the epilepsyfoundation.com. They're they're extraordinary people there, uh, and they do all because I'll tell you when a child is diagnosed with epilepsy, that's the first place they go to, and they say, "What do we do now?" I mean, this is because it comes out of left field. And uh, all of a sudden, you get a call one day that your child has had a seizure. And as I say, it's one of the most upsetting things that a parent will go through. Well, I appreciate you talking about it, John. And then switching it to a lighter subject here. I know you're a self-taught pianist and music has been a big part of your career as well. Does your son take up the piano? Is that something that uh, he got into? Is he, uh, no, or is he's... you know, what, what's interesting about my son is that um, he's, he has a very firm mindset that everything has to be his idea. So we, you know, knowing that we don't try to push anything in front of him, we kind of let it come from within him to use the, uh, the uh, as, as Plato used to say, everything is inside of you, um, but uh, everything you need anyway. Um, and so we just kind of, we just kind of discover what he's good at. He, he does uh, happen to be a wonderful singer. Uh, and so we do uh, encourage him and we continue with his vocal training uh, because it's, you know, he's a great, and also a great public speaker. And I think that if I can imbue my son with uh, with two talents uh, that he can go through life with, one is uh, singing and the other being a good public speaker. Those are the two greatest fears, if you ask anybody, getting up and singing in public and getting up and speaking in public. So if he can walk away with those two talents, I think we've uh, our job is done. Yeah, very cool. What about uh, what's next for you here, John? What kind of goals, what kind of plans, projects are you working on? What's coming up in the future for you? Well, in terms of entertainment, I have several shows that are on the docket right now. Uh, I've got a movie in Greece I've got to do um, as soon as they open that mechanism up. <laughs> Unfortunately, the pandemic has held everything uh, back. I have a one-man show that I uh, that I tour around the country. I still do my stand-up act. I have uh, my uh, musical on Broadway called Chicago, which is now celebrating its 25th anniversary, and I've done over 2,000 performances of the lead there. So I'll be back there this year as well. Uh, in addition to that, I have a waste to energy company uh, that's very that's uh, growing very prosperous and promisingly um, that takes any form of waste and turns it into large amounts of energy, but with absolute zero emissions. And so with our obsession to become carbon free and, and, and leave a zero carbon footprint, um, this is probably uh, going to be a culture changing technology. Wow. Some exciting stuff there, John, for sure. So. Um, last thing I want to hit you with here, I love to ask all the dads that I get on the podcast, what type of advice do you have for that new dad or for that about to be uh, father who's out there listening? Um, try to be there for every moment. Um, and I would even say um, record as many moments as you can so that you can go back and see your child for the infant that they were and watch this wonderful world open up in front of you and them. Because the whole purpose of enjoyment, the whole enjoyment of being a parent is to rediscovering the world through your child's eyes. So 
I encourage you to do that as much as you can. Be a present father, not an absent father. And go through the present moment with them because you'll have so many joys of just living in the present moment with them. And it, it, it's that's the purpose of, of, uh, of being a father. I have, because I ended up on the road quite a bit, I missed uh, portions of my child's life growing up. And I regret that terribly uh, that I wasn't able to share, you know, some, some moments with them. And I had to do it my, myself uh, on stage or, you know, uh, uh, off in the world by myself. Uh, you know, I would love to have had my son. Not to say that he wasn't backstage for many, many uh, times in my life, but there were moments that I really wish I had been there um, in his presence to watch significant moments of growth. Yeah, well, very well said. I love the message. This has been a lot of fun for me. I got to say, John O'Hurley, you're a first-class father all the way. And thank you so much for giving me a few minutes of your time here on First Class Fatherhood. You bet. My pleasure.